The Fairly Odd Parents has always been an interesting show to me. I used to watch it all the time. It was even one of my favorite shows, but I often forget just how much I used to enjoy it. I had to rewatch old episodes as an adult so I could remember what they were about. After rewatching a few, I gotta say, this show had some really mature humor. As it all came flooding back to me, I realized just how many jokes and references went over my head as a kid. Most of the time, I didn't even understand the plot of an episode and just rolled with whatever happened. The writing was certainly different from most other shows you'd see on Nickelodeon, but I still really liked it. I was surprised by just how many lines and jokes I had deep in the back of my memory that I only remembered after watching the episodes again. This show might have had a bigger impact on my sense of humor than I give it credit for. So you can imagine I also enjoyed playing the video games based on it. One of my favorite childhood games was Break Into Rules, but I gotta say, it was extremely challenging. It took me far longer to beat than most games based on cartoons. The other big one was Shadow Showdown. It didn't explore the Fairly Odd Parents universe as much as Break Into Rules, but it followed its own narrative with an interesting storyline and original characters. It was also terrifying. The dream stage almost gave me nightmares of my own. That aside, I played it a ton, and it was one of my favorite childhood games. For most of my life, this was the only version of the game that I knew existed. It wasn't until recently that I learned there was a different one entirely, and I somehow went my whole life not knowing about it. Of course, the GBA one was different, but that was to be expected. I'm talking about the PC version. With how many Nickelodeon PC games I owned, it's strange that this one always passed me by. It was developed by Imagine Engine, who we might recognize from their work on Nicktoons Basketball. It was pretty good, even if I did get some childhood frustration out of it. So let's see what they had to offer us with Shadow Showdown. At the start, you're greeted by the voice of Timmy Turner as he asks you to make a profile. I'm Timmy Turner! Come on in! This is the part where you sign in! For a new game, just type your name here in the box. If you want to load a saved game, find your name on the list and click on it. When you're done, click the play button and let's go! Then we see that the cutscenes are animated, which is a nice touch. So Timmy is eager to watch the finale of Crash Nebula, the in-universe superhero who isn't the Crimson Chin. I wonder if they have a Marvel vs. DC type rivalry. There! I've got the remote! I've got the popcorn! And I've got hives! Oh, I've got hives! And now, the pulse-pounding, spine-tingling, sense-shattering season finale of Crash Nebula! Set your phasers to stun! It's all wrapped up to Right after these messages. Aww, yippee! My hives are gone! I'll admit, that got a laugh out of me. So the TV station shoots a laser and ruins Timmy's reception. It says a lot about the intentions of TV studios. No! What's wrong, Timmy? Is it the hives? Okay, you're pushing your luck with the hives joke. Aside from that, the writing is actually really charming and captures the feel of the show really well. It's gone kablooey! <laughs> Can't you unkablooey like it? Ah, uh, I believe the correct term is de kablooey, coming from the Latin kablooes, which means... It also follows the same plot as the console game, so it had a basis for how the scenes would play out. It's still nice and feels like watching an episode of the show itself. Timmy wishes the TV was fixed, but for some reason, Cosmo and Wanda's magic isn't working. It's the hives! All right, enough of the hives joke. From a writing perspective, some of the jokes tend to overstay their welcome. Even the show itself had problems with this sometimes, so I guess it's fitting. So Timmy's motivation is to get his TV working again so we can see the rerun of the finale. Careful not to get spoiled before then. I can relate to this plot myself. Missing an important episode of a show and having to wait for a rerun was always one of the biggest concerns when I watched TV. It's why I usually went for years without seeing big SpongeBob specials. So to fix this magic issue, the fairies need to go to the Fairy World Royal Palace, that's hard to say, where Oberon and Titania rule as figurehead king and queen. Also, this is a running joke for some reason. It's all right up to this! At least it isn't about hives. So you head to Fairy World where everything has gone topsy-turvy. It's similar to how it was in the game, with giant playing cards and flying cows everywhere. For your first minigame, someone's stolen the suits from the cards and you have to connect pipes to lead them to the right card. It's a little complicated and hard to understand, but easy to win by just clicking around until you have some consistency. There's also a flying cow that goes around switching the cards, so you have to freeze it by running suits into a power-up that does so. It's the first one, and it's probably the most complicated minigame in this entire thing. But again, it looks more intimidating than it actually is. Without them, the cards don't know what game they should be playing! What 
game should they be playing? Bridge, of course! Okay, that was funny. I forgive you for the hives joke. Don't forget about the cow thingy! Right! The cow is a problem! For some reason, the line the cow is a problem is also really funny to me. Just take it out of context and let someone guess what it means. Once you load up all the cards to their breaking points, they fall into a bridge and you can cross them. This is also what you have to do in the console, so I respect the developers for keeping the theme. So back in the story, you meet Oberon and Titania's jester Quince, who stole the card suits because they fired him. He says he'll give you information if you prove he's the funniest jester in Fairy World, which is quite the motivation if I do say so myself. The next challenge is a little weird. Icons appear on the screen and you have to click the one that matches up with the one moving into a basket. Only when it reaches the basket and highlights though. This is like a very complicated rhythm game. It can be hard to reach the right icons because they're constantly disappearing and reappearing elsewhere. Though it's fun when you hit the right ones because you get a little animation of Quince doing whatever the icon depicts. Wow! He really was hilarious! He's laugh out loud funny! Cosmo just said LOL in 2004. Once you get everyone laughing, Oberon and Titania show up. Titania isn't fooling me, I know she's secretly the principal living an undercover life among the humans. Chamberlain, their assistant who isn't suspicious at all, comes with them. They explain that the royal jewel of Fairy World has gone missing. For some reason, Titania opens nearly every line by saying silence. They used to be the rulers of Fairy World, now they're mostly just figureheads. Silence! One is not a figurehead! And does his majesty require another coat of spray-on hair? Silence, Chamberlain! Oh, fleece not. Mm, quite. Silence! Oh, look! <laughs> Flying cows! Silence! Oh, look! Figureheads! Silence, you- I honestly can't tell if this is an intentional running joke or if the writers didn't proofread the script well enough. It's not really funny, so I can't really see it being intentional. They should take notes from Quince. Funniest jester in the world. So you have to find the royal jewel and seek help from Jorgen von Strangle, the fairy world commander. Uh, does someone want to explain why he's so shiny? He looks like Spongebob from the episode Sunbleached. Cosmo also screams at the top of his lungs three times during this cutscene. I won't play it for the sake of your- no! So for your next game, you have to break through Jorgen's defense system because his security TVs were affected by the Fairy World outage. You have to get all the TV screens to match the icon in the corner by clicking the right ones to change three at the same time. Many games like these were everywhere in the 2000s, but it isn't the hardest thing to figure out. Once you win, your transmission is interrupted by a shadow figure who's totally not Chamberlain. I mean, what are you talking about? I have no idea who that's supposed to be. So according to Jorgen, the jewel is being used to steal the magic from the fairies and also TV entertainment from Earth. Because those two things are totally connected. So like in the console game, the only thing strong enough to counteract the royal jewel is a fairy versary muffin, like the one from the show. So Timmy orders all the ingredients for it from the internet. Amazon really does have everything. Also like in the console game, the only way for the fairies to grant Timmy's wishes is by using wishing stars. They allow tiny wishes to be granted if they're collected. Oddly convenient. Almost as if they were made to be a gameplay mechanic or something. So to get wishing stars, you go to the Fairy Academy Trainatorium, a training ground where fairies have to complete an obstacle course and learn to handle magical objects. So now you have to run the course and collect the stars. At the start of the stage, they tell you to use the mouse, but I'm going to tell you something. Under no circumstances, no matter what anyone might tell you, even if it's the last thing you are capable of doing, do not by any means use the mouse. If you do, you're in for the most painful gaming experience of your life. I'll admit though, it is funny whenever he falls over the edge. Whoa! 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 So you have to move Timmy through the course and jump over obstacles while running over a total of 50 stars. Yes, it is a lot. The perspective is weird and most of the time he doesn't pick up the stars even when I touch them. If you get too close to the edge, a magnetic force will come out of nowhere and cause you to fall off. Also, because the perspective is so bad, it's hard to tell when you're supposed to jump. These objects take up at least an inch of invisible space. It's also completely unfair when they put multiple objects after one another. You only have three chances, which isn't enough for how many obstacles you're faced with. Also, check this out. I only needed one more, but see how he doesn't even pick up the two stars he clearly touched. If it looks like I ran over the edge on purpose, I swear I didn't. Like I said, there's some unseen force that causes you to fall over the side if you even get close to it. It's hard to describe. I think it has to do with how floaty the controls are. It's infinitely easier with the keyboard, but the game doesn't tell you you can use it. 
It only gives you instructions for the mouse. When you finally beat it and give an earth-shattering sigh of relief, you get a commentary on society. But as far as I'm concerned, I just passed Trinatorium with flying colors! But won't you feel ashamed, knowing deep in your heart that you only rode Timmy's coattails to greatness without any actual work of your own? Nope, I'm good. When you get back to Jorgen, you find that the ingredients were delivered to Timmy's house and stolen by the people inside it. You're then given four separate stages to complete in whichever order you please. Starting with Timmy's mom, she's using your flour to bake banana bread. She's watching a cooking show when the gorilla on TV comes into reality. Knock, knock. Who's there? Gorilla. Gorilla who? Gorilla my dreams, baby. That's actually a great pickup line. I'm remembering that one. I'll let you know how it works out for me. Also, look at the mom's face. That would also be my reaction if an ape teleported me away to make banana bread for him. I love how Timmy has a gigantic smile on his face as he says this. Again with the goofy mom faces, too. The animators were having the time of their lives with this scene. So you have to save your mom and the flower by climbing this giant wall they're at the top of. Monkeys are throwing banana peels at you and you have to collect monkey wrenches to open gates. If Oomjammer um Lammy is anything to go by, banana peels are highly lethal weapons, so you have to be careful. You can also throw bananas at the monkeys to appease them. This stage is pretty good, but the boss fight at the end isn't very clearly explained. You hit the big ape with bananas until he drops the flower, then you have to climb up and collect it. Then Timmy turns pink for some reason. Well, that stage was bananas. So moving on to Vicky's level, she's watching TV with her mooncalf milk. She's then chosen by aliens to be their leader. That went from 1 to 100 pretty quickly. She's sitting on the throne! Where everybody can see? That's disgusting! The humor in this game is really funny when they aren't repeating the same joke 20 times or blowing my ears out. So Vicky is being assisted by the surfer dude alien from the show, and they plan to destroy Earth with a big death ray. The humans will probably beat them to it, but you have to stop them. Timmy wishes for a gamma suit like Crash Nebula's, and you get a minigame from an overhead view. The instructions make it sound a little more complicated than it actually is. You have to move through a dark maze with only a little light to see around you. You collect batteries to keep your suit charged and jetpacks to fly over chasms. The stage is actually really short and really easy. I only had to collect one or two batteries by the time I beat it. So you turn into a pinball and go into a pinball hole. If they were borrowing elements from the console game, I'm not sure why they didn't use the pinball segment for the minigame. It basically lends itself to being one. But after the nightmare that was SpongeBob 3D Pinball Panic, maybe it's best that 2000s game developers avoided pinball games. So the pinball destroys the death ray by hitting its self-destruct button. Next up, we head to Cincinnati for the Crimson Chin mission. You go into the comic book that Timmy claims had a phoenix egg in it, but this is a little confusing. You go into the comic while the Crimson Chin is fighting for the egg, rather than just teleporting in after the villain's been defeated. Now, I'm not really sure how the logic behind poofing into comic books works, so maybe you can only go in from the beginning or something like that. Then there's no time to lose! Right you are, Lollipop! Um, I mean, chum! I have no idea what that joke is supposed to mean, but it still got a laugh out of me. Cosmo calling Wanda Lollipop came so far out of left field and I didn't expect it. In the comic, the Crimson Chin is fighting his water nemesis H2 Olga. I'm not sure why she's so crudely drawn compared to everyone else. Were her scenes drawn last minute or something? So she uses the Phoenix Egg to drain the Chin's powers, and now it's up to Timmy's alter ego Clef to save the day. Cincinnati is flooded by a giant faucet, so you have to jump on a pogo stick across floating cars and rooftops. Unlike in the console game, the pogo stick is completely unnecessary. It's actually kind of hard to control, especially with the hippo enemies throwing water balls at you. You can collect freeze rays to freeze them, but they're hard to hit and will almost always hit you before you hit them. They're avoidable, so it's best to just avoid their shots and pretend they aren't there. But take a look at this. It looks like I'm messing around, but no, the invisible walls are really hard to work around. You have to work your way to these chin copters that fly you from rooftop to rooftop. Your ultimate goal is to reach H2 Olga and stomp this button until the faucet shuts off. It's not the hardest stage in the world, it's just very strangely controlled. Again, the pogo stick element is meaningless. This stage might have been better without it. So you stop H2 Olga and return the Chin's powers, but you just leave the city flooded and go back to Fairy World. Just in time for Perfect Chaos's shift to begin. So the last ingredient is sugar, which your dad is using to control a sugar-powered robot. He watches a home improvement channel and falls asleep. This means you have to go into his dream. Remember when I said this level freaked me out as a kid? Well, the PC version is a lot more tame. 
The haunted suits are still floating around, but they're less intimidating in 2D. You have to collect light bulbs and summon moths to eat all the suits. You can also unlock doors and use air horns to take out multiple suits at once. It's extremely straightforward. It might be the easiest minigame of them all. You find the sugar-powered robot and take the sugar. It might have been better for the robot to have been the focal point of this stage, but I don't mind them keeping the suits. It was pretty fun. So you head back to Fairy World to make the muffin. Congratulations, puny ones! For once, you stink of mild victory instead of miserable defeat! Uh, actually, the stink might be defeat after all! I've been wearing the same socks for weeks! Was that a pun on the feet? If so, that was kinda genius. So Jorgen uses a machine rather than basic common sense to deduce the shadow figure as Chamberlain. Whoa, I never would've guessed. This might be the biggest plot twist in media history. I gotta sit down. So you have to go find Chamberlain and stall him while the muffin bakes. You head to a TV studio where the jewel is being used to project magic to every television. Imagine how much it would suck for every TV in the universe to be connected to one TV station. Working there would be like working for the gods. Possibly literally, since both Fairy World and Earth are affected by it. Let's not question the nuance and get on with the game. Chamberlain shows up, but as it turns out, he's innocent. His shadow is actually the evil one. Kinda clever how he wasn't actually just a silhouette. It was actually just him. Also, there's a bit of a mistake here. Wanda stayed back to watch the muffin bake, but she's with you in the instructions before the minigame. The Royal Jewel is so powerful, it's messing up the continuity. For this next mission, you have to slam buttons that match the color that's on the video cameras. They reappear in different places, and the shadow is attacking you the entire time. Once you hit the right button, he falls off the stage and you have to go kick him. <laughs> that might be the most pathetic kick any video game protagonist has ever had. So Wanda shows up with the muffin, and rather than just simply eating it, you have to make the process far more needlessly complicated. Using Cosmo as a fork, you have to fling muffin pieces into Timmy's mouth for the final stage. I get wanting to have a final minigame, but what's the point of this? Why not just eat the muffin? Even if this is the only way someone can consume a Fairyversary muffin, why does Timmy keep moving? Why not just stand still so we can make all the shots? Gameplay-wise, it's really hard to tell where you need to aim. There were several instances where I thought I made it, but I still missed. It's hard to find a consistency. But once you win, Timmy wishes everything back to normal and the shadow is defeated. Titania and Oberon come back, still suspecting Quince, but even though his name is cleared, they refuse to hire him back because he's never made them laugh. He then walks in with pies and trips, throwing them in their faces and making them laugh. With that very important story arc wrapped up, you head back home to watch Crash Nebula. That brings us to the end of the Fairly Odd Parents Shadow Showdown. At the end of the day, I like this game. It sort of feels like a full Fairly Odd Parents episode with mini games thrown in. Some of them may be harder than others, but they're still completable. I like that they included elements from the console game as best as they could, and with a few exceptions, the humor really lands. This is a nice little cartoon game you can get some easy enjoyment out of. Right up your alley if you like the Fairly Odd Parents. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.